The Best Extracts from the Joy of Less by Francine J. Space. That's something we could all use more of. Space in our closets, space in our garages, space in our schedules, space to think, play, create and have fun with our families. Now that's the beauty of minimalism. Becoming minimalists puts us in control of our stuff. We reclaim our space and restore function and potential to our homes. We remake our houses into open, airy, receptive containers for the substance of our lives. We declare independence from the tyranny of clutter. It's positively liberating. Generally speaking, our stuff can be divided into three categories. Useful stuff, beautiful stuff, and emotional stuff. Ah, but remember, to be useful, an item must be used. That's the catch. Most of us have a lot of potentially useful things that we simply don't use. Aesthetic appreciation is an important part of our identities and should not be denied. They must be respected and honoured with a prominent place in our homes. Again, if the item in question fills your heart with joy, display it with pride and enjoy its presence. If, on the other hand, you're holding on to it out of a sense of obligation or proof of an experience, then some soul-searching is in order. Contrary to what marketers would have you believe, you are not what you own. It's what we do, not what we have, that's far more illuminating. In reality, the majority of us have no need for celebrity-sized wardrobes, as our clothes and accessories will never garner widespread comment or attention. They tell us that more stuff means more happiness, when in fact, more stuff often means more headaches and more debt. The activities themselves, not the materials, are what's essential to our enjoyment and personal development. However, these items are usually stuffed in a box somewhere, not providing anything to anybody. If this is the case, it may be time to release these relics of yesterday's you. We have to remember that our dreams, memories and ambitions aren't contained in these objects. They are contained in ourselves. We are not what we own. We are what we do, what we think and who we love. With all the time, money and energy it demands, we may start to feel like our stuff owns us, instead of the other way around. Let's take a breather and reminisce about how carefree and happy we were in college. Not coincidentally, that period was likely when we had the least amount of stuff. Things can be anchors. They can tie us down and keep us from exploring new interests and developing new talents. In a similar way, too much clutter can weigh on our spirits. It's like all those items have their own gravitational field and are constantly pulling us down and holding us back. Unfortunately, simply stuffing everything into drawers, baskets and bins won't do the trick. Out of sight, out of mind doesn't work here. Travel is a wonderful analogy to the freedom of minimalist living. When we surround ourselves with things, we're like a tourist in a taxi, cut off from other people and all the interesting things that are happening out there. When we're no longer chained to our stuff, we can save a life, connect with others and participate in our communities. The less baggage we're dragging around, both physically and mentally, the more living we can do. Like it or not, the things we leave behind become part of our legacy, and I can't imagine any of us want to be memorialized as junk collectors or pack rats. Wouldn't you rather be remembered as someone who lived lightly and gracefully with only the basic necessities and a few special items? Have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. Ask the following, in your head, of each potential purchase. Do you deserve a place in my home? What value will you add to my household? Will you make my life easier? Or are you going to be more trouble than you're worth? Do I have a place to put you? Do I already have something that could accomplish the same task? Will I want to keep you forever, or at least a very long time? If not, how hard will it be to get rid of you? 
All we need to do is stop and think why before we buy. Gifts, on the other hand, require a different game plan. I found it best to accept them graciously without going overboard on the gratitude. Because if you make a big fuss, you're sure to receive something similar next year. The solution is simple. Never let them settle in. Keep a donation box outside of your living space, like in the basement, and stash unwanted stuff in there immediately. Photographing the gift also works wonders. If it's a tchotchka, snap a shot of it on your mantelpiece. If it's a sweater or scarf, put it on and pose for a picture. Send the photo to the gift giver and the item to charity and happiness will reign all round. In order to be a good gatekeeper, you have to think of your house as sacred space, not storage space. Sorry, no vacancy sign. A simple refusal up front will save you tons of decluttering down the road. Life is the space between our things. The problem? We put more value on our stuff than our space. By the same token, we don't need to fill all the space we have. Remember, space is of equal value to things, or greater depending on your perspective. A cluttered room usually leads to a cluttered mind. In fact, the greatest thing about space is that it puts the things and people that are truly special to us in the spotlight. In fact, finding ways to enjoy without owning is one of the keys to having a minimalist home. In pursuing a minimalist lifestyle, we need to resist the temptation to recreate the outside world within our abodes. If you're particularly susceptible to buying pretty things, repeat enjoy without owning as a mantra when you're out shopping. In our quest to become minimalists, we want to reduce the amount of things in our homes that require our care and attention. Let's face it though, there's always going to be someone else who has more than us. So, unless we truly believe we're going to become the richest people in the world, it's an exercise in futility to define our wealth relative to others. The fact of the matter is, once we've covered our basic needs, our happiness has very little to do with the amount of stuff we own. Cultivating an attitude of gratitude is far more conducive to a minimalist lifestyle. If we recognize the abundance in our lives and appreciate what we have, we will not want for more. We simply need to focus on what we have rather than what we don't have. Mahatma Gandhi said, live simply so that others may simply live. How can we guarantee that there's enough food, water, land and energy to go around? By not using any more of it than we need. Because for every extra we take, someone else, now or in the future, will have to do without. We must realize that we don't live in a vacuum. The consequences of our actions ripple throughout the world. Our choices as consumers have an environmental toll. Every item we buy, from food to books to televisions to cars, uses up some of the Earth's bounty. Whenever we purchase something, we need to consider the people who made it. Under what kind of conditions did they labor? If it's negative, is our need or desire for this thing worth their suffering? However, we can do an end run around this issue and still minimize our personal consumer footprints by buying local, buying used and buying less. Let's base our purchasing decisions on our needs and the entire life cycle of a product rather than the fact that we like the color or saw it in an advertisement. Streamline. Start over. Trash, treasure or transfer reason for each item, everything in its place, all surfaces clear, modules, limits, if one comes in one goes out, narrow it down, everyday maintenance. Unfortunately however decluttering doesn't happen instantaneously, it's something we have to work at slowly and deliberately. Here's the good news though, as we get into the groove, we get better at it, and believe it or not, it actually becomes fun. I was instantly addicted. 
The high I experienced while decluttering was like no other. It's as if I could feel the physical weight being lifted from my shoulders. The key to starting over is to take everything out of the designated section. Decluttering is infinitely easier when you think of it as deciding what to keep rather than deciding what to throw away. I live lightly and gracefully with only the objects I find functional or beautiful. And I know you know that when I say throw away, I mean recycle if possible. While tossing things in the trash is easy, we must keep the environment in mind. If you haven't used something in over a year, it probably doesn't belong here. Above all, resist the urge to hold on to something because you might need it someday. If you haven't needed it yet, you likely never will. As you're sorting, divide the transfer pile into giveaway and sell sections. Be generous. If you don't have a specific recipient in mind for an item, offer it up on FreeCycle. Simply list the things you're giving away and interested parties will contact you to retrieve them. Focus like a laser beam and declutter the drawer, closet or your room you choose to start over. Finally, no matter what the other answers, always be sure to ask this question. What is more valuable to you, the item or the space it occupies? If you're having difficulty making decisions, recruit an objective friend to provide assistance. A not so good reason, on the other hand, is that it might be worth something. This excuse can bring your decluttering to a screeching halt and compel you to continue providing refuge to useless items. A place for everything and everything in its place. Memorize this mantra, repeat it often, sing it out loud, say it in your sleep. It's one of the most important minimalist principles. When assigning a place to each item, consider where and how often you use it. The whole point of a decorative item is to be able to see it. So if you're storing any such things, other than seasonal items, out of sight, it's time to question why you're keeping them at all. To this end, it helps to label shelves, drawers and boxes with their appropriate contents. Get yourself and your family members into the habit of putting things away. The more space we have to put things, the more things we tend to keep, things we don't always need. Clear surfaces are full of potential and possibility. They are where the magic happens. All we need to conquer our surface clutter is a new attitude and enthusiastic adherence to the following principle. Surfaces are not for storage. Rather, surfaces are for activity and should be kept clear at all other times. Everything we place on our slippery surfaces leaves with us when we leave the room. Reserve your floors for feet and furniture and keep them free of anything else. Heed this rule. If the room is empty, the surfaces should be too. The first step is to consolidate like items. Store all similar or related things together. The advantage of using physical containers is their portability. I'd like to emphasize the importance of consolidating and culling your stuff before containing it. Minimalist living means keeping our possessions in check and the most effective way to do this is by establishing limits. Limits work for you, not against you. Remember, you are not what you own. Storing all those books doesn't make you any smarter. It just makes your life more cluttered. Limit your collection to the allotted space and cull it as you add new ones. At the very least, limit each person's possessions to what fits into his or her room. You can solve this problem by following a simple rule. If one comes in, one goes out. Every time a new item comes into your home, a similar item must leave. Nevertheless, summon up your minimalist powers and commit to one out before you open, hang up or use the one in. Because unless you do it immediately, it'll likely never happen. Therefore, when it comes to the stuff in our closets and drawers and in our modules and zones, we have one mission, to narrow it down.